Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. In this video, we're gonna show off some projects we have going on in the garden here in Raleigh, North Carolina, and a few of the interesting plants that are blooming because of course, this period of time in early April, you would expect uh, lots of things to be flowering in the garden as everything's waking up. And uh, some of the uh, more interesting plants we have in the garden are in their third year at this point. And so when something reaches its, you know, second, third, fourth year, you know, they get better and better each year. So we haven't had many flowers on this solar glow sunbow. It's a sunbow series of azaleas. This one's called Sun Glow, Southern Living Plant Collection uh, varieties. These were actually bred by Buddy Lee, who is the Encore Azalea inventor and lots of other plants. There's a lot of plants in this garden that are actually uh, Buddy's inventions. What he was going for here, he's breeding these native azaleas in uh, southern Louisiana. And with all that heat and humidity down there, some of these deciduous azaleas can end up with very spotty leaves over the course of a season. Uh, very, um, it's just not the best environment in the deep, deep south. So he was, you know, looking for extremely clean foliage and he knocked it out of the park with this solar glow and solar flare, I think is the other one that's in this series. But you can see this one's got the bright orange flowers. They are fragrant. They haven't fully opened yet, so it's not showing off completely, but I wanted to get it, well, you know, before, uh, uh, you know, before, before, it pat, before it passed by. But the main, one of the main things I've been most interested in in this plant is that midsummer, late summer, the foliage still looks really, really great on it. It just has um, a lot of leaf spot resistance and it has great fall color. Again, it's fragrant. It needs part shade. I've probably got it almost in a little too much shade. It's leaning forward just a bit, so it's kind of telling me, hey, you're, I'm, I'm in a little too much shade here, but it's doing fine. The, this one will reach six to eight feet in height, maybe three to four feet in width over some period of time. You can see how it's had an upright kind of narrow habit, but really beautiful. Our native deciduous azaleas are probably undervalued, honestly, in the, uh, you know, in, in the landscape. And they come in colors where, as the evergreen azaleas, which are everywhere, you know, come in whites and reds and pinks and lavender kind of colors. Uh, these come in these vibrant yellows and oranges, and many, many of them are fragrant as well. In an unboxing video from Mr. Maple a few months back, we showed off this Ed Stevens uh, deciduous azalea. This one actually has pink flowers. Uh, really, I'm looking forward to this one. This is one that uh, we wanted here in the garden in Raleigh. And we probably, I'm probably out of room this way, but there's a spot right behind where stuff is holding the camera where this one's going to end up going in the garden during these, uh, during the spring months and it's it's budded up to flower. Can't wait to see some of the flowers on it. It's a little little behind uh, the, one, the one that's in the ground, but looking forward to this. Just a ton of projects going on here in the garden and a few that have already been done that will be in likely a, maybe a video before this one, the lawn in the front garden uh, kind of going away. Maybe that will have already been uh, shot before you see this. The, there was, we didn't know what we were gonna do when with the house, my original plan was to put a porch across the whole front here. And then COVID happened, everything got expensive, everything got delayed. And as you guys know, just in the fall, the new siding went on and this new porch went on. It was just a little, a sh little metal shed roof above it. So, you know, all this has been redone and we just had not done anything on the foundation. There were these azaleas that were this tall across the entire front. I cut them in half one time since I've been here, really, really cut them hard. And uh, they, so they were slightly more full, but they were a good backdrop to everything. But then, and then there was a cinder block retaining wall with small cinder blocks that went on both sides of the porch here. Those cinder block walls have come out. The soil up here is pure sand. So back when the construction was done on this thing 70 some years ago, uh, when they backfilled against the foundation, they used whatever building materials were left over from whatever they had going on. So the soil here up, up here is very, very different. Uh, and then that retaining wall, and then years of those azaleas sitting here dropping leaves. Soil's not bad. It's sandy, but it had a lot of organic material in it from all those years of material just dropping in them. There was a bunch of invasives tied up in here with them. When you get you know, shrubs this big, they can hide things for a long time. So there was English ivy under here and all kinds of things. We had actually dug the azaleas out kind of one or two at the time and put them out on the street and put them on Facebook Marketplace for free. And it's amazing how fast people will come 
uh, and grab something. We're going to do that again uh, in this video and one other I'll talk about in a minute. But I dug the last azalea out that was over here and it had some English ivy around it. So finally, it's a blank slate across the whole front. Cinder block walls gone, foundations painted, sidings on, checking things off the box, right? I had, we had this old fashioned mailbox. We have a walking mail route and there's an old fashioned mailbox up here. And I re, I put it back up on the wall. And so we've kind of concentrated on this, the two, the blue color and the white uh, on most of the house and the shed in the back. And then anything that we're putting on the house from there has been black because so it shows up. We painted that chair in a video last week, Steph painted it, but ha you know, have the black chair and then you know repainted this mailbox which had always been black but had some rust on it got it reattached uh, anyway working on those kinds of details on the outside of the house now as well and now that it's complete going to be putting up some a little bit of lighting in the back garden not something that will run all night i'm not kind of not my thing but something that we can illuminate the back garden if, when we have guests or when we're out there uh, during the evening so that'll be coming up hopefully sometime later this spring as well so our foundation plants had basically been right here, right? Because we were waiting to figure out whether or not this was going to be a whole porch and just skipped it for now and just put this kind of porch on. So this sweet viburnum, this is viburnum odoratissimum. Uh, this particular variety is called sugar cookie. It's in the Southern Living Plant Collection. It was picked because it has a really, really super compact habit. So viburnum odoratissimum. Uh, or sweet viburnum, people call them, get these super fragrant flowers. Not this one this year, because I just cut, I just have pruned it back right as it was about to set buds to flower. But I needed to cut it back some in order to move it. But these get these very sweet, fragrant flowers. Interestingly, the foliage on it kind of smells a little turpentiny when you're pruning it. Kind of interesting. It doesn't smell like that in general, like you wouldn't know until you start pruning on it. That it has an interesting uh, fragrance to the foliage as well. Uh, not a good or bad fragrance, just a little bit of a kind of a turpentine sort of smell to it. Uh, then the, fr the flowers are fragrant. The new foliage on it has this kind of a, a burgundy-ish uh, fo new foliage during the growing season while it's actively growing. They list this one at like five to six feet and it's certainly maintainable at five to six feet, much smaller than the other sweet viburnum are. And we've managed to keep this one, you know, we can keep this one four or five feet tall pretty much permanently here, just prune it after it flowers. Uh, but if you, you could put this out on the edge of your property too, if you're in warmer zones and allow it to get, I mean, probably get eight or nine feet over, over time. Very full habit. Uh, these are hardy in zone eight to 10. And, you know, even in my zone, barely 8A area, I want them up against the foundation. I think if you're in 8B or nine, you can then start using sweet viburnum as, uh, as border plants out in more open space where they might be a little more vulnerable uh, to cold. So, but for us, perfect foundation plant. We'll let it get about this tall. Really great foliage. Uh, just a beautiful, a really beautiful plant. They've performed extremely well. And again, we've kept it up here uh, next to the uh, house. One additional note is it does get red berries where those fragrant flowers are in the spring. So any pruning I do to control the size is going to eliminate those berries. That's just, that's just life when your size is controlling something that happens to also fruit. Uh, you know, you're going to lose the fruit or the berries or whatever it is off of them, but that's fine. I'm just really using it because it has this beautiful, shiny, dark green foliage and then the new growth on it. Now that I've pruned it, all the new growth that comes out on it will be this kind of bronzy color. We've got one on the other side of the porch over there. I'm gonna get it out of the ground and it's going on Facebook Marketplace today. One of the plants over at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum that's always one of our favorites to look at is the serendipity magnolia. This is a uh, banana shrub hybrid. Uh, we have stellar ruby magnolia in the garden and stellar ruby tends to have an upright, kind of an upright narrow habit. Really, really beautiful plant. Serendipity is got similar foliage, uh, similar, uh, similar habit except for wider. So this one, it's gonna get pretty tall and pretty wide over some period of time. These are hardy in zone seven to nine. In zone seven, you probably need some protection from direct wind. In zone eight or nine, it would be okay as a screening plant out on the edge of your property. But you can see how showy these creamy white flowers are. They've got that light banana fragrance. Uh, really interesting plant. Uh, the reason it's actually called serendipity, this is one of Bobby Green's introductions. And if you know the 
uh, October Magic series of camellias. Those are, uh, those are Bobby's introductions, uh, October Magic Ruby and Orchid that we have in this garden. Uh, we have, um, what's the purple one that's in the, what, what's the uh, one that turns red crimson to and crimson and clover? Well, we have, um, what's the white one too? She, white yeah, white she she. Yes, yeah, Steph is remembering all the names. We have a lot of Bobby's plants uh, in the garden. He actually sent this plant to the J.C. Ralston Arboretum with just a number on it. And it sat there and it became this perfect, round, beautiful, lustrous green foliage plant over time. And then it shows off in the spring with these incredible, this, these incredible flowers all the way up the stems. And I think Mark had told us on a video that he kept calling Bobby or, you know, every time he saw Bobby, he was like, he got to give this thing a name. You got to give this thing a name. Bobby didn't think much, of, you know, that it was going to turn out like it did. And so they ended up calling it serendipity. So it's serendipitous that this thing was, uh, you know, became what it became in the garden over at the Ralston. And we're excited to have one. We've had it in a container for a year. It's a little stretched. Uh, we'll get it in the ground and get a little bit of pruning on it as soon as we have a... Uh, the perfect space shows up in the garden. Sometimes for us, that's what that is. We'll have something in a container for a while and you know, all of a sudden the right space will present itself and we'll get it in the ground, but serendipity magnolia. Another project in the last few days, we had the fig plant uh, along the edge back toward the building and it was, you know, six or seven feet tall. I've pruned it a couple times. It was too close to the tree form uh, hydrangea paniculata that I've been in the process of tree forming back there. And I think we need something that's not going to try to get as big uh, in that space. And neither one of us actually eat figs. Uh, I, I do love the plants and I've rooted Gosh, I grew so many figs as a nurseryman. That was one of my kind of expertise because a lot of people, other people struggled to root them and grow them. So, you know, it, you can step into any of those voids in the nursery business. Those are the ones you want to step right into if you figure something out that other people, other people struggle with. We got a na the neighbor over here has got a giant one that actually produces a ton of figs. So if I ever decide that I want to eat figs, I, and I had a I loved them as a kid. For some reason, as an adult, I don't I don't like them as much. I know other people. You know, absolutely do. But I had to dig that thing out of the ground and figs are notorious for being pretty well, uh, well, after about three or four years being difficult to get out of the ground. I was pretty lucky on that one. It wasn't that difficult uh, overall to get it out of the ground. We don't, I don't, that's little spot over there. Um, it had a couple small trees. If you remember back to the very beginning of this, there were a couple little small uh, saplings back there that I'd cut down and those roots still exist here and there. Just happened to hit a spot there where I could dig that thing out. It's not easy, certainly not saying it's easy, but I managed to get it out of the ground enough that we could get it into the cart, take it down here to the road, put it on Facebook Marketplace, and a lady showed up within an hour, Steph, something like that. It was probably about an hour. Steph helped her put it in the car, and she said her mother loved figs and it was gonna be a gift for her. So that's what we like to do on anything we're pulling out of the ground. If we can re-gift it, if I can get it out of the ground in a way that allows another person to be able to enjoy it. I just don't need two of these sweet viburnums. We're gonna do something else up here in this corner and about where the viburnum is, but a hair back, uh, we're gonna put this jubilation gardenia in. Uh, so it's something that's more about this three to four foot height. And then we've got a plan for what goes in this corner as well. But I'm taking this out and, you know, I root pruned it already. Uh, I'm also going to reduce the size of it some, uh, and I did the same thing on the other side. You'll notice that I, I pruned on it um, and, and reduced this, all of this tender new growth is what's using all the water. So me doing all this root damage down at the bottom, there's no way those roots are gonna continue to be able to push this new growth. This should have been done a little earlier. 
you know, ideally all these other projects that have prevented me from moving that thing would have happened a month earlier and I'd have gotten it before all this new growth was on it anyway. That's life, right? Sometimes though you have to move something when you have to move something. We've chosen a cloudy day. It's slightly cool for early April for us in our area. Uh, so it's kind of the perfect conditions. It's supposed to be cloudy tomorrow too. So I dug that thing out of the ground and moved it up uh, to the top and I'm gonna pull this one out, reducing the size on it the same as I did that one. I'm not cutting a tremendous amount off of it. There are some flower buds I'm unfortunately cutting off, but the person who comes and takes the plant and trust me, if you put it on Facebook Marketplace for free, someone will come and take it and hopefully get some use out of it uh, and enjoy it. Uh, by me reducing it, the size of it, and kind of prepping it properly, they'll be able to transplant it well. And this is really just about stopping this terminal growth, right? It just stopping this growth that's where all the water's being used um, in the early spring. It's already leaning forward because I, <laughs> when I root pruned it, I put it on a bit of a slant, pulling back on it. We've talked about the viburnum macrocephalum or the Chinese snowball viburnum a couple times already this spring. One, because we we were tree we tree formed it last year. I limbed it up into a tree and I have it staked up. And where I had it staked, I almost killed it because this thing grows so fast that it had kind of strangled itself here. But it seems to have survived that just fine. And then we showed it just starting to bloom maybe a week or two ago, but that now it's in absolute full flower. These are sterile. Uh, these are sterile, so it's not invasive in any way. These are uh, semi-evergreen, just depends on what kind of winter you're having as to how many leaves it will hold during the winter time. They'll do this full flower here in the spring and then they'll repeat bloom in the fall. A little bit of tip pruning on it uh, will probably increase the number of flowers you'll get later. You know, if I prune it anywhere on this branch, I'm gonna get multiple new branches uh, of side shoots coming out on it. There's a few crossing limbs up here. I'm turning this into, you know, a, a kind of a patio tree and you see where this, these stems are rubbing. This is the kind of thing you want to look for in a plant that you're manipulating like I'm doing, right? As this, this, these two limbs rubbing on one another is not a good idea. There's another one coming right up through the center here. It's got a beautiful flower on it. Uh, you know, infl cluster inflorescence up here right now, but that limb actually needs to come out of there. Uh, so we'll, that's what we'll look for. We'll enjoy these. And then after it's done, get in here and do a little bit of cleanup in it, uh, to, uh, to, you know, to make sure that they're not going to be rubbing on one another in the future. This plant can get 20, 25 feet tall. And you, it was one of those ones you'll get on a tag. It might say eight to 12 feet or something like that. But we've seen them 15 and 20 feet tall around the city of Raleigh and, and pretty big. And some, you know, if they're, if it was shrub formed, it would come out like this and it would take up all this ground space in the future that I'm standing in. But by having it limbed up and having it branched up here, we're basically buying back all of the real estate underneath it that we can plant some other uh, other interesting things or as you know right now holly is holly is occupying that space but in the future we'll be able to underplant it and it'll bloom again in the fall we find a lot of roots out here in this front garden there was the maple in the front uh, when when we first started this project there was a maple in the front and so some of them are the remnant roots from the red maple that was here and some of them, there's Holly in the window, I don't know if you can see her, uh, and the neighbor has one as well. And these red maples, especially up here in this sandy bed, since the roots were able to get under that little cinder block wall that was here, and once they got up in this bed, they just went absolutely bozo. The azaleas are actually pretty easy to dig out. They have very fibrous root systems. But in and amongst those fibrous roots are these big, maple roots that are this big around and so i'm constantly cutting them i typically will dig around them and pretty quickly can cut them out with my this little elongated pruning saw that i have but of course a, a reciprocating saw will work a saws all of some kind and you can just dispose of the blade make quick work of it too there's a lot of different ways a lot of different ways to attack things right so this works for me something else will work for you uh, and whatever it is that's the answer right uh the azaleas I did not, when I dug out that azalea, I didn't dig a big root, wide root, I didn't, big a, I didn't dig a big root system, 
because I was just throwing it away. It was the worst of the, all of them. We had given the other ones away. But when I'm trying to give something away, I am trying to get a decent amount of roots on it like we did the viburnum out there and then cutting it back, hopefully prepping it for the next person that's going to come and pick it up. Uh, of course, I could repurpose it here in the garden somewhere. This is just, we had two of something and I, you know, <laughs> I had to get quickly get that back down to one. <laughs> uh, I think what else? Oh, when where the spot, interestingly, with the spot where the fig was back there, the soil was super wet. Well, it was an interesting find for that little corner. Somehow the water is not getting out of there and out into the uh, side lot. This lot's very, very flat, but for the most part, pretty well drained. And I don't really have issues with standing water, but when I was digging that fig out, just found out that space was very wet. I put a little bit of a, uh, I, I tried to get the water to go out of there just a little bit better, but I'm probably whatever else go, whatever goes into that spot is going to need to uh, be okay in slightly wet conditions or like to, you know, I don't think that's the spot that's ever going to dry out. This is probably both Steph and my favorite Encore Azalea. Uh, this is Autumn Lilac. It's just starting to come into bloom. But two things about this plant. Number one, it bloom, you know, it's a super, super heavy bloomer, really interesting kind of lilac purple color uh, in it, this spotting that's in the, uh, you know, in, in the, each individual flower, really interesting. Reminds me a lot of just old fashioned azaleas where it when it comes into bloom, it's just completely flower to flower to flower, uh, like you would expect from a, you know, spring flowering azalea. And then it does the exact same thing in the fall. It just absolutely becomes flower to flower to flower. And we're, again, we're just, just getting started here. And then in between those flowerings, it probably, to, I think overall, out of the 33 Encore Zellias, and I had a lot of experience with, with them at this point. They're all, they all have different habits, different shapes, different you know, flower colors, all those kinds of things. But this one to me always has the fullest habit. So in between flowering, it's just a perfect little green mound, great foliage, you know, great shape, great compact habit. Uh, this one is uh, hardy in zone six to 10. So it's one of the slightly hardier, uh, slightly hardier ones as well. But this is autumn lilac, highly recommend this one. I just really think it's a great landscape plant beyond the fact that it puts on this full, you know, lilac colored flower show at least twice a year for us down in further south, maybe even three times a year. Also on the fig, in terms of transplanting it, it would be better to do it before it leaves out. But I cut it back, same as I did this. It will be absolutely fine in that other, other other lady's garden. One other thing we have along that, had along the chain link fence before we took it out was mulberries. And we had cut them down, but they were so intertwined in the chain link fence, we could never get them completely out. So having removed the chain link fence, I was, we were able to now go along there. I wish I'd have filmed one, because Steph attacked it, you know, like a, you know, you know, I wish I had a film of her taking one, one of them out. It was pretty good. I, I, was, I was super impressed. Uh, but all of the mulberries along the fence are finally gone. And what happens is we have these hybrid, uh, interspecies hybrid mulberries in the garden and all over the neighborhood where the Chinese mulberry and our native mulberry have crossed and the birds take, take them and they sit on fences and things and that's where they drop them and then the mulberries come up. You'll see them along fences everywhere. They're just such weeds. They're really hard to get out of the ground if they're in the ground for any length of time. And these were four and five inch diameter and grown through the chain link fence. So here we are finally uh, with no more mulberries in this garden, except for I'm sure 900 seedlings that are germinated under something somewhere, but the big ones are at least gone finally. So there, there we go. Lots of little projects going on here in the Raleigh garden, lots of plants that are showing off. Uh, oh, one other thing I was gonna talk about uh, before I wrap this video up. This pink filigree Japanese maple, we think a deer came in here last year and just ate the top right out of it. Uh, I've seen rabbits are pretty notorious on Japanese maple for just chewing the bark on the bottom of them for some weird reason. I guess there's some nutrient thing that they're after in that bark. Uh, but this was a deer we had, you know, had, luckily this so, so far this spring, we haven't seen one in a few months, but back in the fall uh, and earlier last year, we did have them walking through here quite a bit. Uh, we're just attached to some greenway trails around the city that they're able to, to go through. It just bit it down to, from about the size it is now down to here. 
and that stress has caused some suckering down here below the graft. You see this green growth? That is the, that is the plant that this Japanese maple was, uh, was grafted onto. So if you see anything below your grafts on your plants, you know, any kind of damage that happens on the top, any kind of bark damage, any kind of stress the plants under can sometimes produce growth down below that graft. And it is a different tree. <laughs> That's a completely different tree. And this green foliage, Japanese maple will grow much faster than this one will, than this pink filigree. And so if I left this, probably before this season is over, this green shoot would be up here and this would still be down here. So get these kind of things off if you're seeing them, examine the grass on your plants. And we're hoping that, I, I'm hoping this was nothing more than a free pruning <laughs> and me pulling off the, you know, cutting off the suckers down below there, that, 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 will, that growth will stop. I don't know, we'll, we'll know, we'll, we'll know in the future, but this is one we had gotten from uh, Mr. Maple, I think a little over a year ago. So there you go. That's what we have going on here in the Raleigh Garden this week, lots of projects moving the thing forward pretty quickly. Tell us what you have going on in your garden in the comment section below. And uh, thanks for following on.